Good day, students. It's class time. Watch lessons in real time on Television Jamaica, YouTube channel, or One Spot Media, where we are also live on gojamaica.com. If you have any questions on today's subjects, you can send them to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica using the hashtag TVJ class time. I am Jerome Wright, and I'll be guiding you through CSET biology. This week, we are going to be looking at sensitivity and coordination. So let's get into it. Now, before we start, there are objectives that I need to highlight that will come out um, through today's lessons. And first, you need to be able to define stimulus as opposed to response. And you need to describe um, the response of green plants to stimuli and also invertebrates and different light intensities, temperatures, etc. Explain why the response to stimuli is important for the survival of organism. I need to be able to explain the relationship among the receptor, central nervous system, and the effector. You need to be able to explain what we meant by a simple reflex action and also describe the main regions of the brain. Now, it is important for organism to be able to respond to stimulus. It's a characteristic of living organism. And so when organisms are able to detect stimulus, what happens is that it helps them to survive um, in their environment, to be able to respond whether there's too much a high temperature, they need to move away from that, or um, instances where um, for unicellular organism, there is food in the water. They need to be able to move towards that food in order for feeding to occur. Now, this capacity of living protoplasm to respond to stimuli is known as irritability. Right? And in your textbook, um, instead, of, instead of sensitivity and coordination, sorry, you'll see irritability, which means um, the same thing. Now, what do we mean by a stimulus? So a stimulus is any change in the environment and it's normally detected by a receptor which is located in your sense organs. So in this case, touch a frying pot which is very hot, so the temp stimulus would be heat and the response would be to let it go. All right, so the response is any change in behavior of the organism uh, in relation to the stimulus. So the stimulus is any change in the environment. Uh, what we mean by response is a change in the organism behavior in relation to the stimulus. Now, plants also are able to respond to stimulus in their environment. And they respond to stimuli via two ways, gnostic movement and tropism. And if you're in tune last week, we look at some of the, the ways in which plant, or we said that plant actually undergoes movement, and we discuss some of these ways in which plant moves. But we're going to look into more detail as to what we mean by tropism. Now, tropism involves cell elongation, meaning that cell increase in size. All right? Or we can look at the suppression of cell elongation when we talk about tropism. So on one side, as you can see in the diagram to my left, you can see that one side, the cells are longer than the cells that are on the other side. Right, so this side, the cell elongates faster than the cells here, and this side right here. So what happens is that it's going to cause the plant to steal to one direction. All right, now, tropism is growth movement in plants, and there are two types of tropism. We have phototropism, and we have geotropism. In some textbooks, you see gravitropism. Um, it's the same thing as geotropism. Now, you may see this all the time, plant growing towards a light source. You have a nice potted plant, you put it by the window. Over some time, you see that the plant is no longer straight, but the plant is growing towards the window. And you may wonder, what is happening to your plant? It is phototropism. It's growth movement in the response to light. And how does this occur? It occurs because of a hormone known as auxin. And this hormone is present in the growing tips of plant, whether the stem 
are the roots. Now, when the stem, if the light is shone directly above the plant, what happens is that the auxins are going to be uniformly distributed throughout the stem. And so all the cells in the stem are going to elongate at the same rate. So therefore the plant grows straight up. However, if the light source is from one direction, what is going to happen is that the auxins are going to diffuse to the shaded area of the plant. That's the side where the light is not shining. All right? I like to tell my students that auxins are like vampire hormones. You know, vampire don't like light. All right? But don't write that on exam paper. All right? So if light is shown in one direction, the auxins are going to diffuse to the shaded area. In the stem, an accumulation of auxins in the stem promotes cell elongation. So what do I mean? Is that the cells on this side is going to elongate faster than the cells that are towards the side that the light is shining on. So what is going to happen is that the, the stem is going to bend towards the light source because one side will be elongating faster than the other side. And so you have a bending towards that light source. Now in the roots, the opposite happens because the cells in the roots respond differently to auxins than that in the stem. In the roots, accumulation of auxins will accumulate just like in the stem, it will accumulate away from the light source. However, in the roots, the accumulation of auxin inhibits cell elongation. So the sides that contain a lot of auxins will elongate slower than the sides without that much auxins. So the side where the auxin accumulate is going to elongate slower than the side that has little or no auxins. So it's going to bend the roots downwards. So the stem will grow upwards in terms of phototropism, but the roots will grow downwards. And we said that the root will show negative phototropism. That means it grows away from the light source, while stem shows positive phototropism. It grows towards the light source. So in tropism, if the organism move towards the, the, the source of the stimuli, then we said that it is positive. If it goes away from the stimulus, then we say it is negative. So in this case, for phototropism, the stem will show positive phototropism because it grows towards the light source, while the roots show negative phototropism because it grows away from the light source. Now the next tropism is geotropism, and that is growth response in relation to the pull of gravity. Now, if a plant is placed on its side, what happens because oxygen is a hormone, and hormone is made up of matter, and matter is anything that occupies space and has a mass, so therefore it's going to be acted upon by gravity. So in this stem, the oxygen are going to accumulate on the side that is closer to the ground by the pull of gravity. And as with phototropism, the sides that the oxygen accumulate on will grow faster than the sides that has little or no auxins. And so the stem is going to grow upwards because the side with the, where the auxins accumulate, the cells there are going to elongate faster than the sides without. So this is going to cause the stem to grow upwards. However, for the roots, as I tell you, the cells in the roots respond differently to the accumulation of auxins. So even though auxins will accumulate on the lower side of the roots due to the pull of gravity, but in the roots, the accumulation of auxins inhibit cell elongation. So the sides where there are no auxins are, are going to elongate faster than the sides that has the accumulation of auxins. So you're going to force the root to go downwards. So you're going to plant will be looking like this. If you put your potted plant on the side to investigate this. Don't do that at home with your mother's plant though. All right? So you can see that the stem will grow upwards because the accumulation of auxins on the side close to the ground is going to promote cell elongation in the stem. Right? So this side is going to grow upwards because the cells here are going to elongate faster than the cells without. In the roots, the opposite will happen. The sides where the auxin accumulate are going to grow elongate slower than the side that has no auxins. And so the root are going to grow downwards. And what do you think the benefit of this? Why is it that the stem always grow up and the roots grow down? Simple. Stem need to grow up because you know the stems of the leaves 
and the leaves need light for photosynthesis for the plant to make their food. And roots will always need to grow down because, as you know, the roots need to go where water is or plate minerals for the plant. And so in terms of geotropism, we see that the stem grows away from the source of gravity. So the stem will show negative geotropism while the roots grow towards the pull of gravity. So the roots will show positive geotropism. The next type of um, movement in plants in which plant responds to a stimulus is nastic movement. And this, unlike tropism, does not necessarily involve growth. Right? So it's a non-directional response to a stimulus. Right? And the, the movement is generally due to a change in turgor pressure. Loss of turgor pressure means loss of water from the cells of the plant, so the plant loses um, osmotic pressure. And it's generally reversible, unlike phototropism. And these are some plants that actually show, show nasty movement, like the, in country called the Shamo lady, but it's actually a mimosa species. When you touch it, the leaves quail. Right? And you have the Venus flytrap, which is an insectivore. So even though it's a plant, it feeds an insect. So when the insect comes and touches these, right here are sensory hair cells. All right, so when the insect touch it, it closes shut, and you're chopping the insect inside, and it secretes enzyme, and that's how the, this type of plant feed, that's called a Venus flytrap. Now that's our plant. Now as you move on to more animal-like organisms like the protists, we are going to see how they actually respond to stimulus. And in these organisms, there is no specialized structure for receiving and responding to stimulus. What happens is that the, the whole or part of the body of the organism may respond in different ways to a stimulus. So this is amoeba. And how does it respond to stimulus? Example, food is by using one of its pseudopoda. And pseudopoda means false foot. Pseudo means false podia feet. So as you use the pseudopoda to uh, respond to a stimulus. So if there's food in the water, they'll extend their pseudopoda, right? and they move towards it, engulf it, that is called phagocytosis. So they engulf the food particles and secrete digestive enzyme onto it and breaks it down. So they respond to stimulus by using one of their pseudopoda. And then for invertebrates, like the wood lice, what they'll do is they respond to stimulus in a more moving a random fashion until they find a suitable um, environment. All right, so there, there's no really um, direction to their response. They're just agitated, move about rapidly until they find a suitable environment. And this can be investigated using a choice chamber. As you can see here, a choice chamber is really a device that provides contrasting environmental condition. All right, we'll pick it up right here after the break. So we are going to pause right here and take a quick break. Stay with us. Stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
welcome back. Um, so we were at the point where we're looking at how um, unicellular organisms are um, invertebrate respond to stimulus as opposed to plants. So we're at the point where you said unicellular organisms like the amoeba will respond to stimulus by moving towards it or away from it using their pseudopodia. But unicellular uh, multicellular organisms, sorry, like the wood lice, they respond to stimulus by moving their entire body in a random fashion until they find a suitable environment. Right? And this is called kinesis. Um, as you see with the choice chamber, that can be investigated using the choice chamber. And choice chamber is really a device. Right? You can make it using a petri dish where you have contrasting environment. And so if you should put hood lice in it, they will actually move around randomly until they actually find an environment that suits them. As you can see in this case, the environment that suits them is dark and wet. Right? Because darkness, they um, don't like to be eaten, so they're, they're able to hide from predators. And for damp areas, you'll find them there because they don't want their body to dry out or what they call um, undergo desiccation. So they tend to move or respond to a stimulus by a random movement until a suitable environment is reached and they settle there. Uh, um, for Cnidarians, like jellyfish, they have a primitive nervous system and that is called a nerve net. And what that means is that in response to a stimulus, the electrical response will be sent all around the organism, um, no really direction, until a muscle um, is reached and so it brings about a response. So this type of movement in terms of responding to stimulus with electrical impulse, there's no definite direction as to where the impulse will travel. It moves around in various directions until it reaches a muscle that provides a response. But as organisms get larger, we need a more efficient um, system in which we can respond to a stimulus. So we need a, a system where the response is quick and is efficient and accurate. So organism, uh, multicellular organisms develop what is called a nervous system. And organisms are able to respond to a stimulus using a nervous system and they're also another system which we're going to look at later on in the, the, the syllabus, uh, called the endocrine system. These two systems uh, play a major role in sensitivity and coordination for a multicellular organism. And how the nervous system works is that you have a sensory input. All right, so you have a, a sensory neuron. Uh, we have a receptor that picks up the stimulus, sends it along a sensory input to the central nervous system, where it is processed the information is sent back by another neuron to the effector. And the effector is anything that brings about the response. It can be a muscle or a gland. So for example, hear the telephone ring. The audio receptor in the ears will cause it to hear the telephone. The message is going to send to your brain, come back to your effector, which is in your muscles in your arm, to go and pick up the telephone and answer it. So all these stimulus detected and result in a response is what we call coordination. Uh, so another practical example of coordination in organism, uh, for example, you're a tennis player. Right? So the ball is coming towards you. Uh, so you see the ball with the photoreceptors in your eye, pick up the ball, come in, send it to your brain. Now your brain is going to know, um, send messages to your muscles in your arm. I remember I do um, movement in limbs last week. So if I'm going to hit the ball, therefore my bicep will contract, my tricep will relax. All right? If I'm going to extend my arm to hit the ball, then of course tricep will now contract, bicep will relax. That's antagonistic muscles. As I told before, do not social distance your topics in bio. Everything is um, related. So even though that was in movement and support, you see it playing about in sensitivity and coordination. So the human nervous system is divided into two parts. You have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And the central nervous system consists of your brain and spinal cord. And your peripheral nervous system consists of your autonomic nervous system, somatic nervous system. And all of these are just nerves. Right? So your peripheral nervous system are your nerves, the central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord. So consider the thing as 
a big CPU, right, big computer system. So the, the monitor and the, the processing unit would be your central nervous system, right? And then the wires that takes information from your keyboard, your mouse, those are your peripheral nervous system. So they take information to the CPU and also carry information away from the CPU. Right? So that's how your body is programmed. So the central nervous system is this here in green, consists of your brain and spinal cord. And then these other things coming off, I think in red, those are your peripheral nervous system. So those are the nerves in the body. So the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, and the nerves, the cranial nerves, spinal nerves, etc. those make up your peripheral nervous system. Now we're going to look at the brain, which is a part of your central nervous system. Right, now both brain and spinal cord is covered by meninges, which is a membrane in the brain that protects it from bruising. Right, and I'm sure you heard about meningitis, that infection of the meninges give you a meningitis. So the parts of the brain you need to know, I need to know the functions of different parts of the brain. So we have the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata. And those are the three main areas of the brain that we're going to focus on. Later when we're doing homeostasis, you may look at the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. But for now, the cerebrum, cerebellum, and medulla oblongata. And the cerebrum makes up the most part of the brain. As you can see, as organisms get more um, sophisticated, you can see that the cerebrum increases in size. All right? So we humans um, have the largest cerebrum so far because, of course, our actions um, are more complex and it calls for more um, thought process and, and all of that and cognitive ability. So we have a very large cerebrum. Right, so the cerebrum is highly folded and is folded to increase the surface area. Right, so many neurons are packed into the small space. Right, and if you should cut into the brain, you'll see that on the outside is darker than inside of the brain. So the darker region is called the gray matter. Right, and the inner region is called the white matter. And that is also due to the position of the neurons, which we're going to look at later on. All right, the cell bodies are on the periphery of the um, cerebrum, and so it gives a darker shade as opposed to the axons, which are concentrated in the center of the brain, that gives it that whitish uh, appearance. All right, and of course, it is opposite in the spinal cord. So the, in the brain, the gray matter is on the outside, white matter on the inside. In the spinal cord, the white matter is on the outside, the gray matter on the inside. And again, that is due to the positioning of the, the neurons, the cell bodies of the neurons in the spinal cord are concentrated in the center. And the cell body contains the nucleus, so it gives it a darker shade compared to the axon that have the myelin sheet that may give it a lighter appearance. So it's just about the position of the axons and the, the cell body for both brain and spinal cord that gives a different shade in terms of gray matter and white matter. So the gray matter on the outside gray matter in the inside for a spinal cord, but for brain, the gray matter is on the outside. And for white matter, the white matter is in the middle of the brain, while the white matter is on the outside of the spinal cord. Now the function of the cerebrum, sensation, movement, voluntary action, all right, responsible for memory, intelligence, thought. All right, so you now you can understand and appreciate why we humans have a large cerebrum as a couple um, opposed to all the other um, animals because we need a lot of thought process, intelligence and so forth. Um, we move on now to the cerebellum which controls balance and muscle coordination. Uh, it's also responsible for our posture. Right? And so if your cerebellum, cerebellum is damaged, what you have is jerky poorly coordinated response because the cerebellum is what is responsible for um, coordination and posture, right? So it coordinates our movement, so able to walk properly, um, sit upright and all of that. So it responds for our posture, that is the cerebellum. And the medulla oblongata is responsible for our involuntary actions, right? The heart rate, breathing rate, sinesis, all of that, right? All of that are involved in the medulla oblongata, which is responsible for our involuntary um, actions. 
and it is found at the base of the brain, all right, the medulla oblongata. All right, and as I said before, the medulla oblongata is responsible for reflex action, all right, vomiting, coughing, sneezing, etc. All those are as a result of the medulla oblongata. Now we're going to the spinal cord. Right. And the spinal cord runs down the back of the body of the organism. And as you can see, the spinal cord gets progressively smaller as it goes down. And as I said to you before, um, the gray matter is in the center and the white matter is on the, the outside. Right. And the spinal cord is per functional spinal cord is for reflex action, which we're going to look at later on. It also provides a means of communication between the spinal nerves and the brain. All right, this will show you amplified view of the spinal cord, again showing the gray matter where the cell bodies of the neurons are located and the white matter which contains the axons. All right, and so that gives it a different shade. Now from last class, when you look at movement and support and look at the skeletal system, we said that one function of the human skeleton is for protection, right? And one of such is the vertebral column protects the spinal cord. And you see, this is the vertebral column here, and the spinal cord runs through, right, uh, a certain area within each vertebra. And who can remember that special look, um, area that houses the spinal cord? As I tell you, um, every topic in biology is related. Right. So, Looking at this vertebra from last class, you should be able to identify which one it is. It has a large centrum. Look at it, very large centrum. It has long, wide transverse processes and long, wide neural spine. Which vertebra is that? All right. Lumbar vertebrae, all right, which is found in the lower back. So it has a large centrum to support the weight of the body, large transverse processes for the attachment of powerful back muscles, as well as a large and wide neural spine, again for the attachment of powerful back muscles. And see here the neural canal. This is where the spinal cord will pass through. Right? So the spinal cord will pass through this and so offer some form of protection. And this diagram shows you how it occurs. So spinal cord passes through right here. Right? And separating the vertebra is will be a disc of cartilage, right? And sometimes it bulge and spreads against the spinal cord, which may result in, in pain, right? And the spinal, uh, the vertebral column is an example of which type of joint, as we discussed last class. So three types of joints. You have fused joint, um, partially movable, and you have fully movable. So the, the joints in the vertebral column would be a partially movable joint, which is a cartilaginous joint. So it provides some, provides some form of movement, but not much. So it's partially movable joint. So this just shows you, up close and personal, the spinal cord as it's run through a particular vertebra. And again, you should be able to identify this type of vertebra. All right? If you look at it carefully, you see the two holes at the side, the vertebral arterial canal at the sides, right? and this is typical of the cervical vertebrae. As you can see, the transverse processes are small. The neural spine is also very small because the neck don't have that much powerful back mus um, muscles for attachment. Right? And this is a neural canal in which the spinal cord runs through. Right? And of course, the centrum is very small. So this is a cervical vertebrae, identified by the two vertebral arterial canal. As I said to you before, all the topics in biology are linked. So we finish with this central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and spinal cord. Now we move into the peripheral nervous system, which consists of nerves. All right? So nerves is just a bungle of nerve fiber. So I like to look at it as electrical wire, you know, or the telephone wire. You know, and the outside looks like just one wire, but when you cut it, there are smaller wires inside it. The same thing with the nerves. <clears throat> so the nerves are bungled off um, nerve fibers called neurons. So the entire thing is a nerve, but inside it 
are nerve fibers called neurons. So the nerve is just a bundle of nerve cells, just like the telephone wire, right? Um, look like one wire, but when you cut it, there are smaller wires inside of it. Same thing with your nerves. And there are three types, three types of neuron. You have the sensory neuron, the interneuron or the relay neuron, and you have the motor neuron. Uh, so these are the three neurons that makes up your peripheral nervous system. And these are the three neurons side by side. So the sensory are called the afferent because it takes information to the central nervous system, so it's called afferent. And you have the interneuron or the relay, think about a relay race in which the runner takes a button from one um, athlete and pass it to um, the other athlete on the same team. So it's a relay, so it takes information from one neuron and pass it on to the other neuron, so it's a relay neuron. And you have the efferent neuron, and it's so-called because it takes information away from the central nervous system. Now you should be able to label a typical neuron, right? and this is a diagram of a typical neuron stating the functions of the different parts. So you need to know the cell body, all right, the dendrites, um, the dendron, and the difference between a dendron and an axon. All right, so a dendron takes impulses towards the cell body, axon transports Im transmit impulses away from the cell body. Then you have the myelin sheath, all right, which um, offers some form of insulation and so helps us to speed up the electrical impulses. And that is one of the, the advantage of the nervous system that we have, our adaptation of the nervous system to carry impulses quickly because our axons are insulated by the myelin sheath, right? And so it helps impulses to travel quickly. Right? And then you have the nose of Ranvier, again helps with the speed of impulses. Right? And the dendrites um, are attachments, some form is on the other side of the neuron, which you're going to look at, and some may be found attached to the cell body. Depends on the type of neuron that you are looking at. Uh, so the first neuron is a sensory neuron. Right? I need to look at the sensory neuron because you're going to need to identify the differences between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. So you have the dendrites, and the dendrites are normally attached to receptors. Right? And then you have the dendron, which takes the information to the cell body. Right? And then you have the axon that takes information away, or nerve impulses away from the cell body. As you can see, the cell body is projected out of the, the neuron. Right? And again, the myelin sheath that offers insulation. Now the motor neuron, as you can see, the dendrites now are actually on the cell body. Right? And you have the oxen, again, covered with myelin sheath. Right? And then you have a node of Ranvier, which is found um, along the, the axon. Right, so now, side by side, the motor and sensory, or as you call it, the efferent and afferent, and there's other differences for the motor neuron or the efferent have a very long axon compared to the sensory. Um, the motor neuron don't normally have a receptor attached to it, unlike the sensory. Um, the cell body and the motor neuron, as you can see, is at the terminal and it has dendrites attached to it, while the cell body for the sensory neuron, you can see that is projected out of the neuron and there are no dendrites attached to it. So it's projected off the side. Right? Um, for the motor, many short dendrites and the cell body, but for the, the sensory neuron, it has one long dendrite and that is coming from the, where the receptor is attached towards the cell body. So these are some of the differences between the motor and the sensory neuron. Uh, the interneuron, I said it carry impulses from the sensory to the motor neuron. So it's like a pass on the information, just like in a relay race, where the button is passed from one teammate to the other. And so this is arrangement of the neurons within the body. So the sensory neuron that carry the impulses to the central nervous system. You have the relay neuron 
carrying it within the central nervous system and then it passes it on to the motor neuron which takes it from the central nervous system to the effector which can be a muscle or a gland. Now as you can see where the neurons are, they are not intimately linked, there is a space and that space is called a synapse right? or a synapse. Uh, so they don't normally touch each other, but there is a space between where one neuron ends and another one starts. And this is very important because it allows for the impulses to travel in one direction. And so now we're going to look at what is meant by a reflex action. Uh, so the reflex action is a rapid automatic response to a stimulus. There is no thought process involved. Uh, the body does respond to it. All right, for example, um, when light is shining into the eye, the pupil constrict, all right, but in dark area, the pupil will dilate, as you can see. So this is a pupil reflex. All right, and there are different types of reflex action. We have the spinal reflex. An example of the spinal reflex is the knee jerk reflex. All right, so when you go to the doctor, sometimes you're setting your, your reflex, you tap the tendon on your knee, and your, your foot jerk forward, all right? So the message is sent to the spinal cord, the spinal cord passes and the message to the motor neuron. The motor neuron goes to the muscles in your quadricep, all right? Um, causing it to contract while your hamstring relax and so your foot will extend forward. All right, so that's a knee jerk reflex. Another type of reflex action is a cranial reflex. An example of it is the pupil reflex that I've shown you earlier. Um, secretion of saliva, Tearing, uh, that's when you, you yawn or sometimes a tear produced by the tear gland. Coughing, all, right, all those are cranial reflex and involve the cranial nerves. And if, um, the, why a reflex action is important is that it helps to protect the body of the organism. All right? So when I touch something hot, I'm not there thinking, well, should I remove my hand or should I just let it stay right there? All right? There's no thought process involved. So you accidentally touch something hot, you remove your, body, your hand to prevent harm to the body. All right? And all of this occurs within a reflex arc, which is a pathway taken from the nerve impulses, from the stimulus to the central nervous system, and back to the effector. So I accidentally touch something hot, the receptor is going to pick up increase in temperature, pass it on to the sensory neuron, which is going to pass it on to the spinal cord. Uh, within the spinal cord, it's going to pass it to the interneuron, which now pass it to the motor neuron and the message is going to go to my bicep causing my bicep to contract, my tricep to relax and I'm going to lift my hand away from the hot object. All right? So this is a more um, flow diagram to show you what is happening. So stimulus picked up by the receptor passed on to the sensory neuron which passed on to the interneuron within the central nervous system and then it goes to the motor neuron which goes to the response which can be the muscles in my, in my hand. All right. So there's another reflex known as condition reflex which involves learning and you can read up on that um, on your own and also on Pavlov and his experiments. So that's my reading assignment for you. Um, this, this morning, read up on Pavlov's experiment and know about condition reflex. So until we meet again, this is it for CSEC biology. Up next, we have CSEC POB. Stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on OneSpotMedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Good day, students. Welcome to class time. I am Georgetta Thomas Legister, your CSEC Principles of Teach Business teacher for this session. And today, we're going to look at financial institutions. Now, before we get into our lesson today, we want to do a brief recap of what we looked at last time. Who remembered the last topic we looked at? Yes, we looked at logistics and supply chain. So before we get into our financial institutions, we will be doing a brief recap of logistics and supply chain. So come with me to the smart board. Now, so remember last time we spoke about the logistics and supply chain, and we mentioned that logistics is more than transportation. Right? So what is logistics? What did we say logistics is? Now, logistics is a process of planning, implementing, and controlling the efficient, cost-effective flow and storage of raw materials, semi-finished goods and related information from point of origin to point of consumption for the purpose of conforming to customer requirements. Now, we also spoke of the supply chain. What did we say the supply chain refers to? Now, the supply chain is a network between a company and its suppliers. Now, remember that there are four interrelated operations in the supply chain. What are they? So we have the producer or the manufacturer. What comes next? The wholesaler, the retailer, and the consumer. Wonderful. Now, we also looked at some key components of logistics, and I'm sure you remembered them. So we looked at procurement. What did we say procurement refers to? So procurement is a process of finding the right price, um, coming to terms and conditions, 
finding the right supplier. So it's a process that you take before making an actual purchase. Now we looked at inventory management also, and we did state that you need to manage inventory so you don't overstock and, and um, cause loss or wastage and you do not understock because you want to be able to supply the needs of your consumers, right? We looked at transportation and how important transportation is in taking raw materials to the factory and taking finished products on to the consumer. We looked at warehousing and we looked at the fact that warehousing served an inbound and an outbound function. Wonderful. Now, we also looked at the modes of transport within the logistics and supply chain network. We looked at their advantages and their disadvantages. So just a recap of those modes. So we looked at road, rail, pipelines, air, marine, or sea transport. Now, a key point to remember is that logistics can improve competitiveness by meeting the increasing demands of customers at the lowest possible cost. That's the aim of businesses, to cut costs, right? Now, logistics can achieve comparative cost advantage primarily through outsourcing. Anyone remembers what outsourcing is? Right. So outsourcing, in our layman terms, is to contract out a section of your business. And we said that we can outsource transporting. And this allows the business to focus on their core activity. So if your core activity is manufacturing, then you allow someone else who is an expert at transport to get your goods to your final consumers. Wonderful. So that's our recap. So now we're going to move into our lesson for today. What did we say that lesson is again? Right, so I'm hearing financial institutions. Now, at the end of this lesson, you should be able to define accurately the various financial institutions that we will identify. Describe the functions of each financial institution. State the services offered by each financial institution. And describe the relationship between the central bank and commercial banks. So get out your book and your pen and let, let's go. Now, what is a financial institution? Think about it. I want you to record your own definition of what a financial institution is. And when you hear the term finance, I'm sure that money comes to mind, right? Money is something that we use on a daily basis. What is a financial institution? Now, most countries of the world have a similar system that is made up of banks, and non-banking institutions, government regulatory bodies, investment institutions, and insurance agencies. Now, can someone tell me what that system is called? What is that system referred to as? Now, we refer to this system as the financial sector. I'm sure you have heard that term before in a lesson that you did, right? So, we refer to this system as the financial sector of a country. And all entrepreneurs, including yourself, your young budding entrepreneurs out there, all entrepreneurs must learn about business finance. And the best place to start is by understanding the main financial institutions within the financial sector. Now, the first financial institution we will explore is the commercial bank. What is a commercial bank? I'm sure most of you are account holders. Now, which bank do you, which, which, which institution do you bank with, right? What is a commercial bank? So the term commercial bank refers to a financial institution that accepts deposits from households and businesses, makes various loans, and offers basic financial services to individuals and businesses. And here we have some examples of commercial banks Scotia Bank, National Commercial Bank, First Global, to name a few. And of course, you can go ahead and add others to the list. Now, the functions of commercial banks. Now, in the definition, we saw coming out deposits and loans, and they will come out again in the functions. So the main functions of a commercial bank are to accept deposits and to give loans. 
Now, the bank will pay a percentage to the depositor as interest or gain on your deposit. So what this is saying is that if you have an account with a commercial bank, you get interest on your deposit. Now, the longer you allow the money to stay in the account, the more interest it will accumulate, right? Now, remember that the bank is a business. So they operate at a profit, right? So there's an interest charge or a fee that is collected from each borrower for loans. Now, as the needs of society grow, commercial banks have created many services that help to fill these needs. But I want you to pause for a minute. Has anyone recognized that an interest can be both a reward or a charge? Right, so remember first we stated that you get interest on your deposits. That's a reward for saving, right? But you also pay interest on your loan, right? And that's a charge. So this additional fee that you pay um, with your loan payments. Good? Now, there are many services that are offered by commercial banks. A number of services. I want you to state some. What are some services? When you go to your commercial banks, what kind of service do you access from your banks? All right, so tell me about it. Good, so let us explore a few of these services. Now, as we said earlier, one of the main functions of commercial banks is to accept deposits. So commercial banks accept deposits which are placed in either savings accounts or current accounts. And the current account is also known as what? Yes, a checking account. All right, so let us explore. What's a savings account? So basically, a savings account is an interest-bearing account, right, that individuals and businesses use to put away money in a safe place. You want to know that your money is in a safe place that you, you don't need for immediate use, right? So remember now that that savings account, it attracts interest. So you get interest on your deposits. Most of us have savings accounts, right? Now a current account, otherwise known as a checking account, earns less interest, a little less than what you would earn on your savings. But the account holder can transfer money by writing a check. So if someone writes you a check, it means that that person has a checking account with their local bank. Now money can also be deposited in the form of foreign currency. So not just the local currency, but also in the form of foreign currency. Now, another important service offered by commercial banks are what we call credit creation or loans. Now, from time to time, all of us need backup. We need to borrow in order to get some business done. Now, how is it possible for the commercial bank to lend money to people? Where, where does all this money come from? Now, this is made possible by the many deposits received. So all the, the depositors' money goes into a pool. So it's possible that because you have some money in your account, I am able to get a loan, right? Now, a portion of the total cash deposit that is referred to as the cash ratio is kept at the bank and the rest is lent to others. And of course, you remember that if you access a loan, you pay back with what? Interest, right? Now, transmission of money is also another important service offered by commercial banks. Now, the bank transfers the depositor's money as instructed by the depositor, and this is called a standing order. So let us pause a minute and talk about the standing order. You know what a standing order is? Right, so a standing order is basically written instruction from an account holder to the bank to carry out a transaction on the account holder's behalf. So for example, you could use a standing order to ask the bank to transfer a particular sum of money from one account to place into another account on a specific date each month. Now, when you use standing orders, it's most suitable for amounts that do not change over a period of time. Right? So it's the same amount that will be taken from one account to another 
on a monthly basis, normally on the same date each month, right? So you have to ensure that money is in that account in order for the transaction to take place. Now, the depositor can also ask the bank to accept deposits into their accounts from other sources. And you know, with technology now, so someone can go to the ATM and lodge money to your account. They can lodge money from the comfort of their homes using online banking, right? Now, the bank also facilitates the use of checks. Of course, we talk about the, the checking account, the current account. The credit and debit card services are also offered by commercial banks. Now, advisory services, from time to time, we need some financial advice, right? This can be provided by our commercial banks. So these include advice on insurance. So you want to know what policy will be best for you based on your circumstances. Your agent at your commercial bank can give you such advice. Trusteeship, any idea what that means? Right? So legal documents, you're talking about writing up a will to determine who gets what upon your death. Unfortunate, but it's reality, right? No investment management. So you can get advice on how to invest, which business to invest in, which company to buy stocks in, when to buy stocks, when to sell stocks, because they are the expert and they can give you financial advice to benefit you, right? And also you can get advice on taxation. So entrepreneurs and other business persons you're not sure how to file your tax returns, what to do with the amount that you take from your employee's salary, then you can also get advice on taxation. Wonderful. Now, safety deposit boxes. Now, these are special containers used for valuables and documents, which are kept by a bank in a small room or a vault. Right? So it's kept safe. You have a key to access. right? And of course, if you're accessing a safety deposit box, it comes at a cost. It's a service offered by the bank. So of course, it comes at a cost. So if you have something of value that you fear keeping at home in the event of a break-in or some natural disaster, then you might consider utilizing the safety deposit box at your commercial bank. Overdrafts. Have you heard that term before? Overdrafts. Right? No, this is basically permission given to a depositor to withdraw more than the actual amount in their account. Right? No, you have to be careful if you're accessing an overdraft. And this is mostly given to businesses as opposed to individuals. However, there is a specific time period for repayment. And after this date, after this time period, a very high rate of interest is charged. So you have to be careful. If you're given an overdraft, ensure that you repay on time and in full to avoid high interest charges. Now the commercial bank also issue notes and coins. Now they issue notes and coins in the local currency and can also buy and sell foreign currency. So if you want to exchange your US dollars for Jamaican dollars, that can be done at your commercial banks. And if you also want to exchange your US dollars for Jamaican dollars, then that can also be done at your commercial bank. Clearing of checks. So we spoke about current account, checking account, right? So what what is this really? Clearing of checks. Why do we need to clear checks? What is this talking about? No, commercial banks clear checks that are drawn on other banks by accepting the various checks and then ensuring that these are passed on to the relevant authority. No, this system is called the clearinghouse system. So stick a point. No, this system is what allows you to be able to deposit a Bank of Nova Scotia check to your NCB account, right? There are different institutions, but the interbank transaction is possible by the use of the clearinghouse system. Now, if you talk to your parents or an adult in the house, sometimes you might hear them use the term that 
the check is not yet cleared. What does this mean? So you lodge a check from one inst institution into another account, then you might not be able to get ready cash from that check immediately, right? So you might hear that the check needs three to five working days to clear. Now, this is to allow the check to pass through the clearinghouse system. So they have to do their checks and balances. Remember, it's different institutions that you're dealing with, right? So they have to do their checks and balances to ensure, for example, things like enough monies in the account, holder's account to cover the amount on the check, to ensure that the check is legitimate. It's not tampered with, it is signed, and it is in good order. All right, so the clearinghouse system is what allows you to transfer checks between institutions. So that was a commercial bank. Now, we're going to move on to look at the central bank. Right, now, what is the central bank of Jamaica? What is it called? Right, so I can hear somebody at home saying it. So the central bank is what we call the Bank of Jamaica commonly known as the BOJ, right? Now, if you take a look at the monitor, you will see a statue standing tall at the front of the Bank of Jamaica. Any idea whose statue that is? Right, so think about it, let me hear you. Right, so that's Noel Nethersole, dubbed the father of the central bank. So you can do further research to find out more about Noel Nethersole and a little history of the, the central bank. Now, in addition to that, the central bank, the notes and coins that we use are sanctioned by the central bank. So we know that the money that we use, it is legal tender because it is sanctioned by the central bank. Now, if you, I normally ask my students to take out the notes that they have, right? So any money you have in the house, wherever you are, if you don't have any, just ask somebody to borrow a note. You have a look at your note. You will see the signature of the governor. So, who is the governor of the Bank of Jamaica? All right, so let me hear it. So I'm hearing two names. I'm hearing Richard Biles, and I'm also hearing Brian Winter. So who is it really? Mm -hmm. Right, so if you look at your notes as I instructed, you would see the signature of B. Winter, Mr. Brian Winter, right? He's the outgoing um, governor of the Bank of Jamaica. So you might not be able to see Mr. Richard Biles' signature as yet. His signature might be on the newer notes because he has been newly installed as the governor of the Bank of Jamaica, right? So the Bank of Jamaica is very crucial in our economy. Now, Definition of the central bank. What is the central bank really? Now, this is a national bank that provides financial and banking services for its country's government and commercial banking system, as well as implementing the government's monetary policy and issuing currency. So our currency is issued by the central bank, Bank of Jamaica, right? Now, the central bank does not offer banking services to private individuals. So I wouldn't have a savings or a current account at the central bank, right? Neither does it offer banking services to businesses. It is a government institution that carries out certain functions. Any idea what functions the central bank carries out? Think about it and write them down. All right, so let us explore. Now, the central bank is responsible for issuing notes and coins to commercial banks. Yes. So when you go to the ATM and you see so those nice crispy notes coming out, looking like they were just manufactured, right? They might be coming straight from the central bank directed to the commercial banks. Now, it will also redeem damaged notes or coins that have been collected by commercial banks. So sometimes we do transactions and, you know, persons are giving us change and the notes look torn, visibly dirty, and the coins have signs of rusting and you might be hesitant. I don't want any dirty money in my purse, right? So you normally get them from the taxi drivers, the, the conductors, just about anywhere. They want to get rid of these money, right? No, however, 
the money is legal tender. So you can politely ask them to just, just lodge that one. It will be taken out of the system. When the commercial bank sends it to the central bank, it will be taken out of circulation and replaced with new notes and coins. Right. Now, the central bank also serves as the banker to the government and offers services or similar services to the government as those offered by the commercial banks to individuals and businesses. So, let us go back to what we did earlier. What are some of the services offered to individuals and businesses by the commercial banks? And the two main ones we stated were deposits and, and loans. So similarly, the central bank offer or enable government agencies and the commercial banks to make deposits and also offer loans to the government and to the commercial banks under certain circumstances, which we will talk about later. Now, a trivia question for you. Now, the central bank is owned and controlled by, right, can you see the options now? A, the government, B, the shareholders, C, private sector, or D, the country's citizens? All right, think about it and select your answer. Wonderful, I think you have your answer now. So, if you have A, the government, then you are indeed correct. All right, so the central bank does not have shareholders. It is owned and operated by the government. Now, continuing with the functions of the central bank. Now, it is considered to be the bank of all banks. So, it is a banker to the commercial banks. All commercial banks have deposits with the central bank. Now, this involves holding the cash reserves of the commercial bank. And this is a minimum requirement, right? So, the amount of the cash reserves is based on the cash ratio, based on how much the bank earns. There's a certain percentage that must be held with the central bank, right? So the commercial bank is not allowed to give this money out as loans, right? It must be kept at the central bank for emergencies. So emergencies such as, you know, just a large unexpected demand for withdrawals, so people want to withdraw millions of dollars. And because you keep lending money, you might not have enough at hand so to allow for that withdrawal. So persons have to request withdrawals when they want to withdraw large sums. Now, it is also, also the center of the clearinghouse system and ensures a smooth exchange between the different commercial banks. And we explored that earlier. So the clearinghouse system makes it possible for you to lodge a, lodge a Scotia check to your NCB account or your NCB check to your Scotia account. Wonderful. Now, other functions of the central bank. Now, the central bank is management of the foreign exchange reserves of the country. Now, to ensure a stable buying and selling rate for foreign currency. So if the country has a fixed foreign exchange rate, then this is set by the central bank. So the governor of the central bank has a crucial role to play in setting the exchange rate or a fixed foreign exchange rate. Now, the central bank is the regulator of the activities of the commercial banks. And basically, what is this saying? So it is saying that the commercial banks, they supervise the activities of the commercial banks. So there are certain regulations that are laid down by the central bank that commercial banks must abide by in order to operate legally. Now, it is the lender of last resort. So I did mention that the central bank give loans to the government and to commercial banks under certain circumstances. So what do we mean by last resort? If I say that I will help you out, but it's, it's a last resort, what does that mean? So basically, it means that after the commercial banks have tried all options available to them to access funds, the 
central bank is their last resort, when there are no more options, when they're out of options. And it simply means that if the commercial bank reaches a point that it has to borrow from the central bank, then it might be possible that the commercial bank is having serious financial issues. All right, so it is a lender of last resort. Another trivia question for you. Now, which of the following services are provided by commercial banks? So let me see if you're following me. All right. So one, controlling the supply of money. Two, offering loans to small businesses. Three, accepting deposits from customers. Is it one and two only? Controlling the supply of money and offering loans to small businesses? Or is it one and three only? Controlling the supply of money and accepting deposits from customer. Could it be two and three only? Offering loans to small businesses and accepting deposits from customers, or one, two, and three only? Controlling the supply of money, offering loans to small businesses, and accepting deposits from customers. So, think about it. So you should have your answer by now, right? And if your answer is C, two and three only, then you are indeed correct. So offering loans to small businesses and accepting deposits from customers. Good, so ensure that you record that one. Let us move on. Now, we're moving on to look at non-bank financial institutions. So in other words, these are financial institutions, but they are not banks, right? Any idea what these are? Non-bank financial institutions. Think about it. Write down some examples and compare with what we will discuss. Now, just a general overview. Now, a financial institution is a company engaged in dealing with monetary transactions, such as deposits, loans, and investments. Now, there are a variety of non-banking financial institutions, including credit unions, insurance companies, building societies, and many more. So we're going to explore some of these non-bank financial institutions and look at their characteristics. Now, the first one we will explore is credit unions. So are you a member of a credit union, right? No, a credit union is a community savings and loans provider set up by a group of people to benefit a particular community, right? Now, it aims to promote the habit of saving. Saving is important. It provides credit at a very competitive rate and promotes other financial services. Now, a little more about credit unions. And let's just recap. Now, I'm sure you have, well, I'm not sure, but you should have looked at the topic forms of business organizations. Do we remember that topic? Right? So you look at the forms of business organization, the sole trader. Tell me them. Mm -hmm. Companies. Right. So cooperative falls under that broad topic. It's a form of business organization. No. A credit union is a form of cooperative. Now, they are run by members for members. So it means that the clients are the, are the owners, right? So it's by members for members. Credit unions are formed by people who have something in common. So something such as living in a particular area um, or community, those in a particular type of occupation or a form of industry, and members of a particular group or trade union, right? So we have examples such as if you're a teacher, you might be a part of a particular credit union. They have a credit union for teachers. There's a particular credit union for police officers, for communities. So if you're from Manchester, you will hear of the Manchester Cooperative Credit Union, etc. Now, insurance companies, and this is another topic that we explored, right? So when you looked at the topic, go back and recall when you looked at the topic of legal aspects of a business. So you would have looked at contracts and insurance or principles of insurance, right? Now, what did we say insurance is all about? I don't understand why insurance is considered a financial institution here. So insurance companies really compensate the insured for any loss or damage incurred. Now, apart from the services insurance companies 
provide to businesses and individuals to give compensation in the event of losses experienced, they also lend large amounts of money to borrowers, right? So they also invest some of the money. They take in premiums in various forms of business activities and also in the form of interest-bearing loans to those engaged in entrepreneurship. So the insurance company is not a bank, but it is a financial institution. It accepts deposits and it gives loans. Building societies, these are another example of non-banking financial institutions. So building societies are owned by its members and they offer financial services, especially mortgage lending. Any idea what mortgage is? Right, so when we speak of mortgage, we speak of long-term lending, long-term loans in order to purchase property. And this property can be a dwelling, a house, or it could be a commercial building to operate your business. Now, building societies, they accept deposits mainly from the general public, on which, of course, they pay interest. See how many times the term interest came, right? So, and in this term, interest here, is it a reward or a charge? So you have a deposit and you get interest, then in that sense, in that context, interest becomes a gain or a reward. So they pay interest and use funds to finance the mortgages. No micro lending agencies. When you hear the term micro, what comes to mind? All right, and if you take a look at that image on the screen, it will give you an idea, right? So humble beginnings, starting from small, just coins, a very small plant, right? Now microfinancing is recognized as a tool to alleviate poverty. Now that is aimed at millions of people who do not possess the traditional banking, um, possess access to traditional banking um, facilities. Now this might be because of a number of factors. So it could be that they might lack collateral, they might be unemployed or they have poor financial record. Now, another term, very important term, collateral. Now, any idea? Sorry. Just a minute, let us go back a little. All right, collateral. Any idea what collateral means? No. Just to speak of collateral briefly. So there are two categories that loans can fall under. So based on the amount that is required from the borrower, based on the risk involved, a bank or a financial institution might offer a secured loan or an unsecured loan. Now, secured loans require collateral for security. Right? So collateral is basically something of value that the borrower puts up in order to access the loan. Now that might be your land title or your motor vehicle title, right? Now the purpose of collateral is that the financial institution can sell this collateral in the event the borrower is unable to repay, right? So persons who lack collateral, persons who are you know, living below a certain standard, they're not earning much or earning at all, they can access loans from micro lending agencies without collateral. Now for an unsecured loan, basically what supports that is the borrower's credit worthiness. So when you access your, um, go to your financial institution to access a loan, they will ask, they will check out your credit history. So they will see how well you pay on past and existing loans, right? Now, so they lend small amounts of money to such persons. And this, it does not only help them to survive, but also aims to encourage self-sufficiency, independence, as well as self-employment and entrepreneurship, right? So basically, this scheme has produced many success stories as it enables people to buy materials, to make products by hand and even open small shops. So do not underestimate the micro lending agencies. I'm sure that you can identify someone in your community who benefited from 
a micro lending agency from a small loan to start up a business and to maintain or to sustain that business. Now, government agencies, there are some government agencies that can also be considered as financial institutions. So government agencies, often an appointed commission, are responsible for the oversight of specific functions for the government. And in this context, we will talk about the Ministry of Finance. So a Ministry of Finance will have overall responsibility for developing the government's fiscal policy or fiscal and economic policy. Now, what is fiscal policy? So the fiscal policy is basically the means by which a government, you know, monitors the spending levels and tax rates to, to influence the economic, the, the economic stability of the nation, right? Now, the ministry would be responsible for overseeing and regulating the collection and allocation of public revenues, as well as playing an important part in the socioeconomic development of the country by creating a society that promotes a better standard of living for all citizens. And this can be done by effectively managing the economy. All right, and that's all the time we have for CSEC Principles of Business. Up next is Cape Chemistry. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on OneSpotMedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
Welcome back to class time. It's now time for Cape Chemistry. I am your teacher, Ricardo Price. Today's topic is forces of attraction. Let's get into it. Now, before we get into today's lesson, let's take a look at the objectives set out in the Cape Chemistry syllabus. Now, some of these objectives were accomplished last week, but I'll still run through. Now, last week, we looked at what is dative covalent bonding, and we described dative covalent bonding as a covalent bond, and we know that a, a bond contains two electrons. Now, in a covalent bond, this, these electrons are shared between the atoms, meaning that one atom gives one electron to the bond, and the other atom gives one electron to the bond. But in a dative covalent bond, both of those electrons are coming from one of the atoms. Now, we also, we also described the origins of intermolecular forces, specifically the hydrogen bonding interaction, the permanent dipole, and van der Waals forces of attraction. And we described hydrogen bonding as an interaction, an electrostatic interaction between a hydrogen atom that is attached to an electronegative element and it is interacting with another electronegative element. An example of a molecule that exhibits hydrogen bonding is water. There is also protein and DNA. The permanent dipole, we describe this as a molecule in which one of the atoms is much more electronegative than the other atom. An example of this would be HCl. We described the van der Waals instantaneous dipole or an induced dipole. A molecule that exhibits this would be bromine where the molecules come together and an induce and one molecule induces the other molecule um, to have a dipole moment. So last week we looked at VACPR, but we didn't get to finish this concept. So the objectives for today is to finish VACPR and predict the shapes and bond angles in simple molecules. And we also hope to explain the shapes and bond angles in simple organic molecules and make reference to hybridization and resonance. Now, so let's take a look at VACPR theory. For this section, of the lesson, you guys will need to get your pens and your pencils and write down the steps in predicting the shape. You might not understand while writing down the steps, but we'll work a few examples and it will become a bit clearer for you guys. Now, what is VSEPR? This is valent shell electron pair repulsion theory. So the concept is based strongly on electron-electron repulsion. Now, it says that this is a concept used in chemistry to predict the shapes and geometries of molecules. The premise is based on electron-electron repulsion, as I just said. But before we get into VSEPR theory and, the, and the, the, the steps to predicting the shapes, let's define a few terms. Now, what is a lone pair? A lone pair is simply a pair of electrons and an atom. What is a bonding pair? A bonding pair is a shared pair of electrons in a covalent bond. Now let's move to the board for you guys to clearly see what I mean, mean by a lone pair versus a bonding pair. Now, so with this molecule here, this is just a molecule that I made up, a molecule XYZ. On X, you can see that X has two lone pairs of electrons sitting on top of it. X also has two bonds. X is bonded to Y and X is bonded to Z. Now, we know that electrons make up bonds. Each bond has two electrons in it. So this bond right here has two electrons in it like that. Right? So these electrons making up the bond is called the bonding pair. It also has another bond right here, and this bond also has two electrons. 
Therefore, this bond, the, the total bonding electrons in this molecule is one, two, three, four. So it has four bonding electrons and two lone pairs, right? So that's what I mean by a lone pair and a bonding pair, because I'll be making references to these terms quite a lot in VSEPR theory. Now let's get back to the smart board. Now, lone pairs of electrons repel other lone pairs of electrons as well as bonding pairs, right? So what do I mean by this? I mean, if you have two lone pairs of electrons sitting right next to each other, the repulsion would be very great, right? The electrons don't like other electrons. They're both negatively charged, and we know that opposite charges attract each other. So if you should have two lone pairs right next to each other, they will repel each other. And if you should have a lone pair next to a bonding pair, those will repel as well because the, the bonding pair also has electrons in it. Now, let's get into the steps on how to predict the shapes of molecules. The first thing that we should do, and you guys should write down this, um, this will be repeated on one spot media as, as well as YouTube. So you can either take a picture of the screen, write it down fast if you can do that, or rewatch it on YouTube, pause the video, and write down the steps. The first step says identify the central atom. And the central atom is usually the least electronegative element. The next step says, draw the molecule in the simplest possible geometry with all the atoms as far from each other as possible. Now, why did we say this? This is because the bonds in the molecule have electrons in them, and you have to put the electrons as far away from each other as you possibly can. So we draw the molecule in the simplest possible geometry with the outer atoms as far from each other as possible to reduce electron-electron repulsion. Now, the next step says we should sum the, the number of valence electrons in each atom and subtract the bonding electrons from this total. So, for instance, you have water. Water has H hydrogen, it has two hydrogens and an oxygen. The valence electrons in oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons, hydrogen has one, but there are two hydrogens, so that's two plus six, so the total valence electron count in water is eight, the six from oxygen and the two from the hydrogens. So we sum the total valence electrons, and then when we get that total, we should subtract the number of bonding ele electrons from that total. The remainder that you get once you subtract the bonding electrons, you should add those to the outer atoms first. And if you have any excess, that's when you put it on the central atom. So this says the remainder of the electrons should be added to the outer atoms first until they have their octet of electrons or until their valence energy level is completely full. Then if there is excess electrons, we move to the central atom. The last step says, now to apply the VSEPR theory, we use the lone pairs to repel the bonding pairs and this will change the shape of the molecule. So this is the last step that actually determines the shapes of these molecules. Now, we will work some examples. We will predict the, the molecular geometry of BF3 and H2O. But before we actually do that, it's important to note that a lone pair, lone pair interaction or repulsion is a lot stronger than a lone pair bonding pair um, repulsion. And that is because the lone pairs are just sitting on top of the atom, right? They're not, they're not involved in bonding. Bonding electrons are more dispersed or spread over a larger area, it's a bit diffused. So the interaction between two bonding pairs is not as strong as the interaction between two lone pairs, right? The charges are a lot greater on the lone pair and it's a bit diffused in the bonding pair. So two lone pairs right next to each other would repel each other greatly. 
if a lone pair is next to a bonding pair, it would repel each other as well, but not as strongly as if two lone pairs were next to each other. And bonding pairs also repel bonding pairs, but not as strong as a lone pair, lone pair repulsion. And I'll show you what I mean with some of these examples. Now, the first one says we should predict the molecular geometry of BF3. Hopefully you guys have recorded the steps and we'll do it right now. So we'll move to the board. So, in a question like this, your teacher, or on the question paper, they'll give you the molecular formula, BF3. And they'll say to you, pre predict the molecular geometry of this molecule. No, the first step says that we should identify the central atom. The central atom is usually the most electronegative, the, the least, sorry, electronegative atom. Here, boron is a lot more elect, is a lot less electronegative than fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative element, right? So I'll use boron as my central atom. There's another way of predicting the central atom. In this molecule, BF3, there are three fluorine atoms and only one boron. The central atom is the one with the fewest number, usually. So in this case, boron, one boron and three fluorine. So boron would be my central atom. And then the next step says that we should arrange the molecule in, a sim in the simplest possible geometry with the bonding pairs as far from each other as possible. So there are three bonding pairs. So I'm going to arrange it like this. They're as far from each other as possible, right? The next step says that we should sum the valence electrons on each atom. So boron, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron. Boron is the fifth element. The first two electrons would be on the first energy level and then it would have one, two, three valence electrons. So boron has three valence electrons, and we know that fluorine is in group seven. It has seven valence electrons, but there are three fluorine atoms. Therefore, this would equal to 21, so when we sum the total valence electrons, it's 21 plus 3, and that is equal to 24. So this is the total valence electron count in the molecule. Now, there are three bonds. There are three bonds in the molecule, and we know that each bond has two electrons in it. So since there are three bonds, we know that there are six bonding bonding electrons in this molecule so we have to subtract that six from the total and we would end up with 18 electrons remaining because those six electrons um, had to go to making up the bonds now what do we do with the remainder um, with this remainder of 18 electrons we have to put them on the outer atoms first and ensure that their octets, octets are completely filled. And then we move on to the central atom if we have excess electrons remaining. Now, let's focus on this fluorine atom. This fluorine atom has one bond and that one bond has two electrons in it. So those two electrons are count as valence electrons. And we know that fluorine can hold a maximum of eight electrons in its valence energy level. So therefore, since it has two electrons, it needs six more to get that eight. So I give it that six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And each fluorine is in the same situation. So I, I have to do the same thing for the other two. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 
So we used up all 18 electrons. So we have no excess electrons to put on the boron. Therefore, the molecule retains its shape. So this shape that you see here is the shape of BF3. If there, were a, if there was a lone pair on the boron, the shape would be distorted because the lone pair would start pushing down on the bonding pairs and it would change the shape of BF3. So therefore, BF3 is what we call a trigonal planar. Planar. It has a trigonal planar geometry. And the bond angles between BF3 is 120 degrees. Now it's important for you guys to know the shapes of these molecules as well as the bond angles. So if, some, if your teacher tells you that you have a trigonal planar molecule and she or, or, you, or if your teacher asks you what is the bond angle of that specific shape, you'd have to know. Now let's move back to the smart board. So we'll be moving back and forth between the smart board and the, the whiteboard. Now, you can see the bond angles between B, BF3, right? Now, for water, the shape of water is what we call a V-shaped. And you can see it here on the screen. And the bond angles between water is 104.5. And I'll show you why the bond angle in water is less than that for BF3. So let me erase this board. Okay, so water is H2O. So, I'll use oxygen as my central atom. And to draw it in the simplest possible geometry, I draw it like this. I draw it straight, linear, right? Now, I know that oxygen has a valence electron count of six. Hydrogen has a valence electron count of one, but there are two. So, it's six plus two is equal to eight. However, there are two bonds. Therefore, there are four bonding electrons. So, eight minus four is equal to four. So, I have four electrons to put on these atoms. Now, the first thing that somebody would do is to put these four electrons on the hydrogens first. But hydrogen, the valence electron on hydrogen can only hold two electrons. And it already has those two electrons because it's sharing those two electrons within this covalent bond. Therefore, the hydrogens are fine. They don't need any electrons. So we have to put these four electrons on the oxygen. Like that. Now, what would happen is that you would have the lone pairs repelling each other. This is kind of small, but bear with me. The lone pairs would repel each other and push, push each other apart. And in so doing, it would also repel the bonding pairs. And what, ha what happens is that water develops this shape. Where the lone pairs are over here, are pushed apart from each other and the bonding pairs are pushed down into a V shape. And you can see the V. So it's V shaped. And the bond angle is 104.5 degrees. So you can see the difference that the lone pairs of electrons have or make on these molecules. Put back these. Now, let's look at the shapes of some other molecules. Let's look at methane. Now, methane 
has a tetrahedral geometry, right? The bond angles within methane is 109.5 degrees. And you can figure out the shape of methane using VACPR theory. So I'll allow you guys to practice with methane. However, I'll do some of the more difficult ones. So it's important to remember the shape. As I said, the shape here is tetrahedral. The bond angle between each CH bond is 109.5. Now let's look at BeCl2. BeCl2 has what we call a linear geometry. And you can see that it's, it's linear, it maps out a line, right? And the bond angle here is 180 degrees, right? Now, I'll do ammonia and SF6 for you guys. Right. Right. Okay, so with ammonia, what is the molecular formula for ammonia? The molecular formula for ammonia is NH3. So I want you guys to write NH3 at the, in your books because we're going to predict the molecular geometry. Now, so we're dealing with ammonia, NH3. Now, the central atom here is nitrogen. There is only one nitrogen and three hydrogens. So, I'm going to write it like this. N, H, H, H. A simple symmetrical geometry, right? So, what is the valence? How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? So, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen. First two electrons are in the first energy level, so nitrogen has five valence electrons. So nitrogen donates five, hydrogen donates one, but there are three hydrogen atoms. So hydrogen gives three, so that's a total of eight. But we have three bonds, that means six bonding electrons. So we have to subtract six. So we have two electrons remaining. The hydrogens are okay. They have their two electrons in their valence energy level. Therefore, these two electrons have to be put on the central atom. Once we put those on the central atom, what happens? You know what happens electron-electron repulsion, because this is VACPR theory, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. The, th the theory is centered around this concept. So the lone pairs repel the bonding pairs and push them down, push them closer together. The bonding pairs would rather be closer to other bonding pairs than to be close to a lone pair, essentially. So what happens is that the lone pair pushes the bonding pairs closer together so you end up with a, a shape like this where you have the lone pairs on the top and the hydrogens down here. The wedge means that it's coming out of the board towards you. The hashed line means that it's going into the board, behind the plane of the board. So this is kind of a 3D representation of something like this. And this is a pyramidal structure. A pyramidal structure. Right. So, the pyramidal structure and the bond angle here is 
eight degrees. And this is so because of the lone pair. So the lone pair essentially pushes these bonding pairs together. So if the central atom has a lone pair on it, this will happen. Now let's look at SF6. SF6. Now, how many valence electrons does sulfur have? Sulfur has six valence electrons. Fluorine has seven, but there are six of them, so that six times seven is 42. So we have 42 electrons coming from fluorine. Sulfur has six. When we sum those, we'll get 48. Let me separate these two so you don't get confused. So you have 48. Now, I should have drawn this before. F, 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 F. Okay, so when you have six atoms around a central atom, I first draw it in this geometry to ensure that the atoms are as far as each, from each other as possible. Now, looking at this, you can see that you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six bonds. Therefore, you have 12 bonding electrons. So if we should subtract that, we would get 36 electrons remaining. No. This means that we have 36 electrons to put on these outer atoms. So, let's start with fluorine, this fluorine. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and 36. So we used up all 36 electrons. We used up all 36 electrons on the fluorine. Thus we have no more electrons to put on the sulfur. Therefore, the shape remains the same. So, the shape of SF6 is octahedral. The bond angle is 90 degrees. And just to note, you guys should remember the shapes and the bond angles of these molecules. Now, let's get into the shapes of organic compounds. Now, what is an organic compound? No, an organic compound or an organic molecule is a molecule consisting of carbon atoms covalently bonded to each other. And it also has carbon atoms covalently bonded to hydrogen atoms. If the molecule only has carbon and hydrogen bonds, then it can be referred to as a hydrocarbon. Some organic compounds possess outer atoms such as um, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and halogens. Proteins are organic compounds because they have um, carbon and hydrogens in them. And we know that proteins have oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur as well. But a hydrocarbon is one that only contains carbon and hydrogen in its structure. Now, 
these organic compounds, they can have multiple bonds or single bonds. The ones that only have single bonds are termed alkanes. The simplest alkane is methane. It has a carbon atom covalently bonded to four other atoms, right? I'll get into the shapes of these. Um, I'll get into the shapes of these alkanes soon. Now, you have methane. Sorry about that. So, you have methane, ethane, propane, and butane. Ethane is a two-carbon alkane, propane is a three-carbon alkane, butane is a four-carbon alkane. Now, ethene is a two-carbon alkene. So when you have alkyl, sorry, organic compounds that contain double bonds, they're no longer called alkanes, they're called alkenes, right? So a two-carbon alkene, which is the simplest alkene, is called ethene. The three carbon alkene is called propene and the four carbon alkene is called butene. Now, you can have organic compounds bearing triple bonds as well. And these are called alkynes. And they have a linear shape. You can see it on the diagram the e with ethine, right? It has a triple bond and it has a linear geometry. What's the bond angle? It's 180 degrees because it's linear. No, with ethene, with ethene, the bond angle is 120 degrees between the CHs, right? And it has a trigonal type geometry, while the alkanes have a tetrahedral geometry. And we know the bond angles with, with tetrahedral compounds. It's 109.5. That's why we taught VACPR before we got into this. So, we can see the shapes of the molecules here. Methane, 109.5, with a tetrahedral geometry. You can see the alkene with the bond angle of 120 degrees with a trigonal type geometry. And that's the same for benzene as well. Benzene has a bond angle of 120 degrees between the CH and the CC bonds. And we can see the alkyne at the end with its linear geometry. And the bond angle in the alkyne is 180 degrees. Now, let's get into hybridization and what hybridization is. Hybridization is essentially the mixing of atomic orbitals to form new hybrid orbitals. Right? What do I mean by that? Let's look at carbon because carbon is an atom that exhibits hybridization. No. Carbon has an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. No. When is an orbital considered stable? An orbital is considered stable if it is completely full or half filled. Right? So let's look at the electronic configuration of carbon again. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And we're focusing on the valence, electro, the valence energy level. The 2s is completely full. The 2p is neither filled nor is it half filled. It has two electrons in it. But we know that the 2s orbital is very close in energy to the 2p. Thus an electron can jump from the 2s to the 2p. And we see that right here. We have the 2s and the 2p an electron can transition from the 2s to the 2p to generate four new hybrid orbitals. It's hybrid because they've mixed, the 2s mixed with the 2p to generate these four hybrid orbitals. And these are called uh, sp3 orbitals. Why sp3? Because you have 1s and 3p orbitals mixing to generate this new hybrid orbitals. Notice they kind of have a look like a p orbital. It kind of looks like a p orbital. And that's because it has p orbitals in it. It's three p orbitals mixing with one s orbital. So the hybrid orbital will look like a p orbital. And this is, the, this is how it looks. So alkanes are sp3 hybridized. 
each of these sp3 lobes can be bonded to another carbon or a hydrogen so this is the hybridization state of carbon in alkenes let's look at alkenes with alkenes you have a transit an electronic transition from the 2s sorry all right we're back so you have an electronic transition from the 2s to the 2p right but with the s with alkenes you only have two of the p orbitals mixing with the s orbital and you can see the unmixed p orbitals still in the same position right so when one s orbital and two p orbitals mix we generate what we call an sp2 hybridized orbital and you can see if you look at the bottom the the diagram at the bottom you can see the unmixed p orbital there in orange showing that it didn't mix it's still there right and you have three new hybrid orbitals in green which are sp2 orbitals and this is the hybridization state of alkenes now when you have one s orbital and one p orbital mixing this generates what we call an sp orbital makes sense one s one p right therefore you have two unhybridized p orbitals there and these p orbitals can overlap with other p orbitals and this is what generates the triple bond right so alkynes are sp hybridized and remember the shapes of these molecules s um, alkynes linear 180 degrees between for the bond angles Alka alkenes are trigonal in shape the bond angles 120 with alkanes it's tetrahedral and the bond angles are 109.5 so it's important to remember the shapes of these molecules as well as their bond angles so so with the the sp hybridized orbital you have the p orbitals now these p orbitals as you can see here in red and in blue once they come in contact with other p orbitals they can overlap so you can see the red orbital overlapping with the other red orbital the blue orbital overlapping with the other blue orbital to generate something like this where you can see them fused together and that is what actually generates the triple bond and the same is true for the alkene. Now, that's the time we have for Cape Chemistry. You can watch today's lesson again on onespotmedia.com and on JNN between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. Class time resumes tomorrow at 9.45 a.m. right here on TVJ. Until then, keep safe. Remember to wash your hands, sanitize, and wear your masks. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.